Execute Order 66. Oh, hello, I'm Adam from No Rolls Bar. Don't worry about that. And welcome to Board Game Masterpieces, where we hand select a game we believe is an absolute essential purchase for any board gamer. We give it the works, a brief rundown of its history, a deep dive review, and a how to play, all wrapped in a beautiful bow. Cheers. This episode, we are looking at my personal favourite board game of all time, Cosmic Encounter. Cosmic has become regarded as one of the pillars of hobby board gaming. One on arrival broke a bunch of rules about game design, but has since become a benchmark for replayability and raucous fun, not despite of, but because it's something of a wonderful mess. And what I truly think makes it essential is I believe it has the potential to be not all of the Sith, or all the Jedi, but all of the board games. In Cosmic Encounter, you are all different alien races vying for total galactic dominance. Remember when Yoda said, was not make one great? Well, f off Yoda. Turns out that little green nerd never played this board game because that's exactly how you become great. You'll be acting as generals, sending wave after wave of your own ships to war, making alliances with other great powers and watching Liberty die to thunderous applause. So this is the starting setup, and it doesn't look like much, but it's got it where it counts, kid. You've got 20 spaceships of your color spread evenly across your five planets that make up your home system. And look, they stack on top of each other. It's, it's great. Which begs the question, how do you stack yours? Are you the librarian? The daredevil? The piece of shit who just can't do anything right for f sake. So these five planets are called your home system. Throughout the game, you'll be having battles or encounters in other people's systems, trying to wipe out your opponent's forces and land your ships on their planet, which gives you a foreign colony. Always nice to hear a British man explain about foreign colonies. Sorry about all that everyone else in the world, by the way. When you get a foreign colony, your victory token moves up by one. If anyone ever gets five, that player instantly wins. Now, if all these battles and territory grabbing reminds you a bit of Risk, well then aren't you a clever sausage? Because Cosmic was actually designed by four friends in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, Bill Eberly, Peter Olotka, Jack Ketteridge, and Bill Norton, with their inspiration being, basically, what if we took Risk and made it not a Chore. Originally published back in 1977, which is ancient for a hobby game, by Eon Products, a company actually founded by the designers themselves. Fun fact, it was originally going to be published by Parker Brothers, aka Darth Monopoly, but they eventually pulled the plug on the game claiming space doesn't sell. What else came out in 1977? Oh, that's right! No, for real, Cosmic Encounter and Star Wars came out the exact same year, with almost the same exact title, except this is what you get out of thesaurus.com to impress your teacher. After it was released, Cosmic bounced around from publisher to publisher for the next 30 years. Loads of people had a go. Games Workshop for a time, Mayfair, Hasbro had a pop and threw some plastic toys in there, because the Hasbro, of course, they bloody did. Before, in 2008, we ended up with this edition from Fantasy Flight Games, and this is the one that finally stuck. This made the game feel complete. Up until this point, Cosmic Encounter had gained a cult following because, you know, it's rad and we'll get to that, but this is when Cosmic finally arrived, due in fact to this lovely little bit of graphic design. See, look here, get nice and close. In the Fantasy Flight edition of the game, they included this little phase bar. Now this tells you not only when the card or alien power you're using can actually be played, but it sets in stone the structure of a whole encounter, basically a player's entire turn. Now this edition, this phase bar is so fundamental to cosmic success and in interviews, the game's original designers credit it with making the game finally work. And Kevin Wilson, the in-house designer at Fantasy Flight who added this little bit of graphic design. He is listed on Board Game Geek as one of the game's co-designers. That's how fundamental this is. It also provides a really clear and easy framework for me to teach you how to play Cosmic. Because trust me, to really understand the joys of Cosmic Encounter, you're gonna need to understand how it works, or rather, how it's supposed to. 
So, on a player's turn, they are going to have a Star War, a Celestial Contention, a Cosmic Encounter. He said it! And each encounter runs like this. First of all, we have the regroup phase. Basically, at any point in the game, if you lose a battle, your ships are destroyed by being sent to this circle in the middle of the table called the Warp. Think a Cosmic Scrapyard. What a piece of junk! The regroup phase lets you take back any one of your lost ships and plop it back on any of your existing colonies. Welcome home. Then the encounter begins in earnest with the destiny phase. Basically, instead of choosing which player you want to attack this turn, you're going to turn over the top card of this destiny deck, and that'll tell you which player you have to attack instead. Maybe you'll have to attack red, or maybe whoever's got the most foreign colonies, or you could even turn over your own color and use that to boot off someone who's got a colony on one of your planets. Get out of here. Right away, this rule is awesome, because someone has a terrible first turn and gets bullseyed like a womp ran, loses a bunch of ships, then people can't just dogpile automatically on the weakest player. That's no fun. And right there, risk problem number one fixed. Bravo, Cosmic Encounter. Then begins the launch phase. Once you've worked out which player you're going to be fighting, you use this cosmic ice cream cone of impending destruction to single out which planet of that color you're going to attack. Pro tip, go for the planet with the fewest ships on it. Once you are locked on target, you choose up to four of your ships to send into battle. They could be taken from any of your existing colonies. For example, I might send two ships. So right now it's two ships versus my opponents two ships and defender breaks tie so I'm just going to add one more now it's three on two and right now I'm winning Great kid. Don't get cocky. now comes the alliance phase where each side of the battle starting with the attacker can invite players to ally with them and add up to four of their ships to the total come on blue be on the right side of history and this is where negotiation bargaining begging and outright threats come into the game and instead of in Risk, where if you're not involved in a battle you have nothing to do but watch, in Cosmic you can be involved in every single turn. Scheming, bargaining, reinforcing, leaving someone to perish. Join me and rule the galaxy. What? Help me pants this nerd. Oh, no. So, it's treason then. Every turn you're engaged with what's happening on the board. Risk problem number two, fixed. Bravo Cosmic Encounter. Well, what's in it for your allies? Well, if your allies join you in attack, they add their forces to yours. If your side wins, hey, you get a foreign colony as well. Huzzah for that. However, if your allies join you in defense, come on, Blue, you son of a bitch. If your side wins, you don't get a colony on the planet you just helped defend, but for every ship you put at risk, you get to draw one of these very important cosmic cards from the deck. But Adam, what are cosmic cards? Shut up, I'm getting to that. I cannot teach him. The boy has no patience. So now all the allies have been secured and all the ships have been put in play, we enter the planning phase. That's when each of the main players, the main attacker and main defender, must select one, just one encounter card from their hand. See, at the beginning of the game, each player is dealt eight of these cosmic cards from the main deck. There's a bunch of different types of cards, but the main type is encounter cards, which comes in two main forms, attack cards, with values ranging from zero to 40, and negotiate cards, which are basically a white flag and a pleading look with your hat in your hands. Please don't hurt me, I'm baby. So during the planning phase, each of the two main players, not their allies, takes one encounter card from their hand and plays it face down. That's the planning phase over and done with, immediately followed by the reveal phase where both cards are turned over. If both cards are attack cards, then you simply just add the amount on the cards to the numbers of ships on each side, and that gives you the total war value, I guess. The bigger number wins, you know, like any Star War. The attacking side has played an eight, which gives them a total of 13. The defending side has played a 10, which gives them a total of 14. In this case, the defenders win. However, at this stage, if players have reinforcement cards in their hands, this is both main players and allies, they can play them like a volley of laser fire from a smuggler with a heart of gold you thought had f***ed off earlier. The attackers play a plus five, which bumps their total up to 18, beating the defenders 14. Now let's blow this thing and go home. They get to move in. Tiddly tiddly tee. 
the defenders get fucked. And then, woo, up they go. Another foreign colony together. Huzzah. However, if one or more players plays a negotiate card, things are a little different. Now let's say the defense knows they're gonna be crushed and they play a negotiate card against the other side who play an attack card. When a negotiate card goes up against an attack card, the negotiating player automatically loses the battle, but they get a little something with their loss. They get compensation, which means that for every one of their ships that was destroyed, they get to take that many cards at random from their opponent's hand. Oh sure, you accept a defeat and let them just march right into your embassy, but as you held the door, you nicked their f***ing wallet. If both players play negotiate cards, then literally their allies just go home. Piss off, Blue. That then leaves the main players to negotiate alone, like literally a one minute timer start and both players just haggle out a deal. Maybe let's swap some cards or perhaps you can have a foreign colony on one of my planets if I can have a foreign colony on one of yours. No, wait, that's not the deal. I am altering the deal. Pray I do not alter it any further. <laughs> Let me have my fun. So in Risk, you rolled dice and left it to chance. In Cosmic, you manage your hand. Pick the right time to play the right card. Become an ally at the right time to gain more cards. Negotiate at the right time to maybe steal your opponent's best cards. And yes, sometimes you can have the best laid plan and there's always a bigger fish. And that can be frustrating, but it's a hell of a lot more tactical, thrilling and daring than just rolling and hoping over and over again. Risk problem number three, fixed. Bravo Cosmic Encounter. A lot of Cosmic Encounter lives in these cards. Not only are there special cards you can play at random times for random bonuses like cursing some players or just a straight up nope card that says, hey, you know that thing you're trying to do? Take a lap, Chuckles. But also there's just a whole bunch of game just here, just right here. I mean, it's war meets poker. You're thinking, he looks confident. Has he played a big card? I mean, I've got a big card, but I might need to save that for later. Maybe he's bluffing and playing a low card, trying to lure my big card out of my hand. But maybe he's playing a negotiate and I can maybe play a negotiate too and try and get a colony for free, essentially without my allies getting one. Oh God, maybe he's playing a big card now. Oh God, oh, f oh no. Once the cards are revealed and all the numbers and ships and reinforcements are finalized, then we enter the last phase of an encounter, the resolution phase. If the attackers win, all the defenders, go to the warp, sorry about that. These guys move in and they get one more foreign colony, one step closer on the path to ultimate galactic victory. However, if the defenders win instead, then the attackers go to the warp, sorry about that. Then the defending allies, this guy sent two, gets his two cards as a reward. Well done, piss off blue. And then these guys, they get nothing, but their home wasn't invaded. And in a lot of Star Wars, that's a plus. If the attacking side wins, that counts as a successful encounter and that player can have a maximum of one more encounter if they choose. But if their side loses, they've had a failed encounter and their turn is over. It moves clockwise to the next player and the whole encounter process starts over all again at the regroup phase. And right there, you have a really solid game. Lots of scrappy warfare, bluffing, negotiations, surprise reveals, mean card play. Like, that's a good enough little game. But we can't leave it there. Because yes, we've talked about why Cosmic Encounter is a better version of Risk, but we haven't begun to talk about why Cosmic Encounter is one of the greatest games ever made. And that would be because of a wretched hive of scum and villainy. That would be because of the aliens. Every player at the beginning of the game is given two random aliens and picks one to play as for the rest of the game. So every player will be a different alien and each alien has a different ability, an ability some consider to be unnatural. Now these aliens are secret until their power is used for the first time in this grand, well actually I think you'll find reveal slapping their alien race down on the table and suddenly, it is you who are mistaken about a great many things. 
Because these alien powers are so OP, they shatter the basic rules of the game. We're not talking about vanilla special powers like, oh, you're the wood clan, so you get one extra bit of wood every turn. I mean, this power cannot be killed. Its ships can never be sent to the warp. It's always operating at full strength. It can't be killed. And right now you're watching this and you've got one burning question right in the forefront of your brain. How can I defeat a player whose special power is they cannot be killed? And that kind of dilemma, those kind of insane high stakes where the situation on a dime becomes elevated to sheer head in your hands unfairness. All you can do is laugh and then you grapple with it and it's exciting. And then you realize that every single player has a nuclear weapon up their sleeve that may not be as ostentatiously boss level as I cannot die, but if they use it correctly, I've got a bad feeling about this. The masochist wins the game if all of their ships die. How do you fight someone who wants to die? The sorcerer can swap the player's encounter cards in a fight. Do you send your best card against them, hoping to bluff him into not swapping the cards? Or do you send your worst card, double bluffing that maybe they will swap them? The TikTok wins the game by doing a little dance and hoping that people share it. Wrong TikTok. The TikTok wins the game if enough failed encounters happen. So every time you successfully fend off an attacker, you're actually one step closer to handing the TikTok the entire game. Let's look at an example encounter with these four alien powers. Now I'm green, haven't revealed which alien I am yet. Ooh, mysterious. I'm going up against the red player who is the sorcerer who swaps encounter cards in an encounter. Now I'm only on two foreign colonies, so I, I really need this win. So I'm gonna send, uh, let's send four of my ships. Now I ask yellow, because I've got one foreign colony, hey, ally with me, get in on this. You know you want to. But yellow says no, they're gonna sit this one out asshole. The blue player already has three foreign colonies, so I don't want to invite them because if I win this encounter with them, they will get a fourth foreign colony and be one away from winning. So I say, uh, no thanks, but they go, oh actually, I am the parasite though, which means their special power is they can join an alliance without being invited. So blue says, oh don't mind me, I'm coming to. Oh, this is fun. Suddenly this has gone from a fight I would like to win to one I pretty much have to lose. So I say to the sorcerer, look, I only have high attack cards, but if you swap the cards and use your power, you're, you'll win this encounter and everything will be fine. Sorcerer looks at me thinking, hmm. Is that true or is he bluffing? Maybe I actually only have low attack cards and I'm trying to win this encounter and I'll deal with blue down the road. Eventually, Sorcerer agrees, oh, okay, let's swap these encounter cards. Boom, thank God. So red has 23 to my 11 total with all the ships and the points added up. So we lose, but I reveal, ta-da, I am the spiff. So even though I failed this encounter, because I lost by more than 10, I can crash land one of my ships on Red's planet, whilst mine and Blue's, more importantly, go to the warp, which then ends up giving me that third foreign colony that I really needed. And all the while, because it's a failed encounter, Yellow just quietly reveals that they're the TikTok and they are one step closer towards victory. The game was originally released with 15 powers, but because the game's been around for decades, between the first release in 1977 and the Fantasy Flight Major reboot, there was a full 30 years, meaning there's 30 years of new powers, bad ones being removed, fan favorites coming back, and now even without the expansions, in this base box, there are 50 tried and tested alien races. That did not spread like I thought it would. Running the maths on that for five player games, which is the best player count for base level cosmic, that's over two million unique combinations of aliens. And every single time your path to victory is a new puzzle because everyone else is an overpowered bastard. With all the expansions added to the game, that comes to 160 total aliens. More than, in fact, and that's before you even get to the flare cards. Adam, what are the flare cards? So you remember in the beginning I said you're given two aliens to choose from. Well, each alien has a corresponding flare card. You take both of those that match the aliens you were given and those cards go in the deck as well. If you get one of these flare cards in your hand, like say the zombie, even if you're not the zombie, you can get a light or as it says on the card, wild 
version of their power, which is great. For example, the Filch. Their power is they can steal a card that their opponent has just played from the discard. However, if someone gets their mitts on the Filch Flare card, the wild power means that as long as they're not caught, they can steal any card from the discard at any time. It's legalized cheating. This game is mental. But what I hear you ask, if you are the zombie player and you get the zombie flare card, well then you get the super version of that power. And that, Dello Felagets, is when shit gets real. So you might be thinking, how can a game with this many alien powers be balanced? And the answer is, it isn't. Of course it isn't. Cosmic Encounter is lumpy, sometimes wildly unfair, and sometimes over before you know it because someone has an unstoppable power at the worst possible time, and some gamers hate that. For some gamers, a game where you can fail through no fault of your own is bad design, and absolutely Cosmic Encounter does not feel like a game that has been measured and trimmed with a fine scalpel by a clockmaker until everything is in exact perfect harmony, because to do that, would necessitate making some of the powers less awesome. Instead, Cosmic feels like it was designed by who it was designed by. A bunch of mates who thought, wouldn't it be fun if you could do this? And I love the transparent, giddy joy of that. Cosmic emphasizes sensation over strategy and reactions over reliability, and that trade-off is absolutely worth it. Which isn't to say that Cosmic's all down to the luck of who's got what power. The base system of Cosmic Encounter, the foundational rules that the alien powers bend and break, this risk style head to head of numbers versus numbers mitigated by negotiation, mitigated by bluff, by hand management, by not being able to pick on the weakest player because of these destiny cards. It's a robust enough system to survive all of these aliens and let you form, or at least try to form strategies to achieve solo victory. But if you don't want to, if the combination of powers just happens to be making the game drag on, Cosmic Encounter has a mechanic that I personally hate, but I also recognize the game probably needs, which is shared victories. <sighs> See, in some games like Munchkin, where you can get close to the end, but then are pulled back at the last moment by another player, then someone else tries to win, they're pulled back and so on and so forth, everyone being dragged backwards over a bed of gravel until fun is a name that I haven't heard in a long time. Then what can happen is two or three or four players can join an alliance. They can all get five foreign colonies at the same time in one encounter. They all win in the same go, leaving maybe one person all by himself, doesn't get a victory and you know, it's fine. And like, yeah, that's a really good failsafe, allowing players to call time on what is essentially an unbalanced game before it outstays its welcome. But also I hate it because Adam doesn't share victories. Then there's the social element of why Cosmic Encounter rules. These races all come with little bits of flavor text that you can read out before you reveal yourself, like a herald at a ball announcing the arrival of a new and terrifying foreign dignitary. Attacking vicious space monsters at incredible odds comes naturally to the Valorous Spiffs. Their cunning and courage have let them save the day even when their doom seemed imminent. Let those who face them beware. Your power is framed with this character, a backstory of cruelty or patience or heroism or animalistic rage or quiet mysticism that not only, yes, gives you an in-game real advantage, but also something to role play. And because alliances form and break and rebuild and there's betrayals and hurt feelings and desperate grabs for power, there's genuine organic storytelling here. There is so much in this box. Strategy, yes, luck, yes, cruelty, yes, Funny voices, hell yes. I also don't think a more replayable board game has ever been made because every single time you are overwhelmingly likely to get a different cocktail of aliens and therefore differently sized and shaped gears in a mechanism, a puzzle that can only be solved not just with luck, not just with negotiation and double dealing, not just with bluff, but most likely with all of them combined. There are a lot of great board games out there, but Cosmic Encounter is all the great board games. It serves so many thrill centers, introduces brand new mechanics every single game, is as close to endlessly replayable as a game can get, and serves as one of the great communal experiences in the hobby. I cannot promise you a balanced, strategic game, 
but Cosmic comes with such great social potential that I must demand that you at least give it a try. Do or do not? <laughs> give it a try. And thank you for watching the first episode of Board Game Masterpieces. If you liked it, check out No Rolls Barred for more great recommendations for board games, loads of fun, silly things from the world of tabletop gaming. And hey, share this around on Twitter, Facebook, all, all those things, why not? <laughs> and remember, always remember the tagline to the channel, get on board. <laughs>